I'm Stacy Smith. I'm the co-chair of the Cedars Lewis Planning Commission along with Roger Clark. And we're very blessed to have Patricia Lyons with us this Sunday to talk about C.S. Lewis. Um, how many of you read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Long ago. Yes. Oh. Recently? Like in your adult life? <laughs> <laughs> if you have not read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, we have several copies for sale right outside the door. I'm Katie Rural is selling them. I think they're $10. So I would highly recommend buying it and reading it. It's a wonderful read aloud with your children or your grandchildren, too. So. Um, so let me introduce Dr. Lyons. Uh, before serving on the current staff of the Episcopal Bishop of Washington, D.C., as the Director of Evangelism, Dr. Lyons spent 20 years as a high school chaplain. During that time, she published the acclaimed book on adolescent spiritual imagination called The Soul of Adolescence. Since then, Dr. Lyons has served as an adjunct professor at the Virginia Seminary, teaching courses in Christian ethics, systematic theology, theological fiction, and the intersection of popular culture and the gospel, including Harry Potter, which is our theme for next year. I'm kidding. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> she has published numerous book chapters, sermons, and articles on faith formation and the role of the imagination in following Jesus. In the tradition of C.S. Lewis, Lyons describes herself as a 21st century Christian apologist. She has published writings on Lewis and has been a speaker on radio, podcasts, and presenting the ideas of Lewis to over 100 churches, schools, and the diocese across the country in recent years. Dr. Lyons is going to return next Sunday to the forum to talk about the great divorce and the screw tape letters and how they teach us about using our free will to find freedom and joy in our daily walk with Christ. And she'll also be back in March for the big C.S. Lewis weekend with lots of C.S. Lewis scholars from all over the country and across the pond, and I really hope you would come and come back. It's going to be a wonderful weekend. So, anyway, without further ado, Dr. Lewis. Well, thank you very much. Some of you were just in church, so you're just like repeat offenders. This is great. <laughs> Um, how, just let me know for, um, if Jesus doesn't come back, when does this end? <laughs> I mean, you got to leave that open. <laughs> Don't, okay. So next week, we're, um, we're going to deal with the heaven and hell question. I love talking about heaven and hell. That's probably because I spent a lot of time working with uh, teenagers. Uh, no, 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 not like that. No, um, uh, that's what they want to know about. And, and we never ask someone, by the way, if they believe in heaven and hell. That's just a way of saying, are you all in on your beliefs or not? That's just the question that gets to that very quickly. What you believe about love and, you know, yeah. But it's, if someone really brings that up, what they want to know is, do you really believe what you're saying? Uh, and that's one of the reasons why Episcopalians don't often talk about heaven and hell. Because many of us don't know if we believe what we're saying. And you don't want to go on record of being mean when the truth is you're not really sure what you believe. So we're not uncertain about heaven and hell. We're insecure about what it means to really have, hold Episcopal beliefs. Uh, so the, the heaven and hell question is only as anxious as your Episcopal identity. Uh, and by the way, it's, there's not one answer to that. But, but if, that, if even my joking about it now, you're kind of the temperature just went up a little bit. You know, your Fitbit just gave you a couple of steps or something. Uh, come back next week uh, because there are wonderful things to say about heaven and hell that will change your life. Not your eternity. That's not that's not the main effect of your belief on heaven and hell in the Episcopal Church on your, it, it affects your daily life. C.S. Lewis is a great phrase. He says, there are no ordinary people. And what he means, if you, if you really take seriously that every person is created in the image of God, every person has a soul, there are no ordinary people. There are odd people. <laughs> There are some in here. <laughs> if you don't see any, it's because you're it. <laughs> the, the, 
church and its conviction of unconditional love draws all kinds of people. Our challenge, though, uh, today is to say something about Narnia. So I wanted to say a few things about Narnia, uh, and then I'd be interested to hear a few things from you. Because uh, quite often when, when we have church, um, in fact, one of my uh, students went to an even song. Um, um, by the way, there, there's, a, there's a senior citizen I know who was just becoming an Episcopalian um, and said that she wanted to go to a, a service at the seminary that night and she, she knew they were going to sing a song. And, you know, I, I know the rotation of worship and I thought, I don't remember that we're having any kind of musical evening prayer for that. Um, and the person said, no, no, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a song. And I was thinking, well, it sure is a strong word. Um, <laughs> And she, and she said, but it's called Even a Song. <laughs> <laughs> the problem, though, with Even Song is, is when young people don't want to go, when I say why, they're like, I don't like watching music. And sometimes I think one of the reasons we, we lose people of all ages at church is when they show up, they watch church. Um, which... We are not meant to watch church. That's boring. Um, it's deadly, actually. Because even if you believe there is something powerful happening at the altar, the idea that you're just supposed to watch. So um, I, I have no intention of speaking to you today and having you watch someone talk about C.S. Lewis. So I will say a few things about Lewis, um, and then I hope to hear from you. So that not, neither one of us is just watching the other, that we might be listening to one another. I remember when we take a baptismal vow to seek and serve Christ in all persons, which means each and every one of you, in addition to not being ordinary, each and every one of you has Christ in you. And so does the villain of your political life. We took a vow in that belief. So I'll be curious if the extent that I can before I leave to hear and see the Christ in each and every one of you. Lewis would want no one gathering in his name that didn't leave reminding themselves of that. Um, one of the things I posted on Facebook, um, and very few of us maybe are, are friends on Facebook, um, was when I received your beautiful brochure of the year of C.S. Lewis. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen it, multi-page, beautiful. Um, well, not long ago, when I got my copy of it, thank you, Brenda, for saying it, uh, and my mom loves it, um, <laughs> she comes over to my house and gathers up all the pictures and things like that. Um, and I looked and I saw on the page where my picture is, underneath the picture is your preacher for um, two or three weeks from now, uh, a C.S. Lewis scholar, one of the best in the country, um, named Dr. James Como. Dr. James Como um, has been a professor in New York City for decades of film and film criticism, but he was the founder of the C.S. Lewis Society of New York City in the 60s. Like only a few years after Lewis died, he already had friends in New York City who gathered together and wanted to read his work. Um, because he died, not unexpectedly, but Lewis was um, struggling with cancer, um, but Lewis had the unfortunate, let me ask, did any of you know um, what day he died? It won't, be, it won't be your fault if you don't, because um, he died on a, a, a morning in November in 1963. He had the unfortunate death to come three hours before John F. Kennedy was shot. So there are a great many people uh, who followed Lewis all over the world that really didn't know for a few days or even weeks that he had passed away um, to die on the same day as John F. Kennedy. Uh, but so there are some people in New York who, who knew him. Um, uh, as Dr. Como, who's coming to speak to you, met C.S. Lewis, um, and they formed the oldest C.S. Lewis Society in the world uh, out of New York City. It is a thriving organization to this day. Dr. Como um, was the father uh, of a friend of my brother's, so my brother's best friend's dad was this weird professor. Um, and when I was about 13, I met him for the first time. And uh, I grew up across the street from a Catholic church. And um, I this town, do you know anything about Westchester County? 
um, and I was told that we were in a Protestant town. I had to whisper that. Um, I think my parents' great fear once I went to college was that I'd become a Protestant. Uh, <laughs> so you see how that worked out. Um, <laughs> Actually, it was raised that there are Catholic, that there are two kinds of schools in America: uh, Catholic schools and Protestant schools. Uh, and I, I was a little bit older when I learned that the rest of you call those public schools. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I loved being Catholic, and I loved the Catholic Church uh, and the little red candle that said Jesus was there. Uh, and that Catholic Church was really like an extension of our home. I'm getting to uh, what C.S. Lewis um, means to me, and I hope when you leave here, what you'll be aware of is what C.S. Lewis means to you. And if you haven't started reading Lewis, it's not too late. So uh, when I was eight years old, uh, my family was very involved in the Catholic Church, and we went on a church retreat. Now, what you need to know is my parents' first child, my mom was 18, and my father just got back from the Korean War, got married and had my uh, sister uh, nine months and an hour after they got uh, married and, uh, <laughs> and then didn't have any uh, children for about 10 or 12 years. My mother had a kind of infection that they couldn't do anything about and uh, over that time they developed a procedure for that infection and that could be um, dealt with. Uh, so then my brother was born and a year later I was born. Uh, my sister was 12 when he was born and uh, 13 when I was born. And then my mother got sick again, and she was fine, but she couldn't have any more children. So we had one of those odd, stretched families. Um, and my sister, I think it was hard to have two young babies uh, and two parents who struggled in every way, financially. And uh, I remember when I got into college, I was very excited because that was the first time I'd had health care. Um, I didn't have to worry with, you know, running, playing games that I would, you know, break my leg and lose a car or something. So we, we had a lot of that anxiety and things were uh, difficult. Uh, my sister started to party a little bit uh, and then a lot. Uh, I really became a pretty serious high school drinker. Um, work hard, play hard. Uh, it turned out the reason I went into high school ministry was watching uh, how lost um, people can get at that age. Um, and we went on a church camping trip uh, with our parish and they, they had a fight with her. She didn't want to go. She finished high school and she was feeling very independent. Uh, while we were on this uh, camping trip, um, she was a drunk driver and was killed uh, in a car accident. And uh, the troopers came and found us uh, on the parish retreat. Um, so I remember being so sad, I was eight um, at the time, because I, I, I started to notice my parents weren't going to church. And that, that was the part of death I could understand, which is I, I think we're going to stop going to church. So that's when I started going on my own, uh, and I went to church every day uh, when I realized that that was a thing. Uh, and I sat with four or five other retirees every morning before uh, high school, and uh, uh, but occasionally I would see this odd man that lived in my town, Dr. Como, and he would come in quietly in the back of the church before getting on the train to Manhattan. Uh, and he saw me and never said anything, and one day when I was near his house picking up my brother, he, he said to me, so what are you and I going to talk about what we do in the morning? <laughs> I was 16. He was probably I don't know, 55 or something. His kids were not interested in religion at all. <clears throat> and uh, we started to talk, and he, he asked me if I knew anything about C.S. Lewis, and I didn't, and he started to teach me about C.S. Lewis, and then he invited me to come to the C.S. Lewis Society of New York. Uh, and my parents thought, Everyone in the town knew that there was a weird Catholic professor. And <laughs> my parents already knew I was a weird Catholic kid, so they thought this was great. <laughs> I can't tell you what it meant though, uh, to me to be a young person and have someone share C.S. Lewis with me and take me seriously. He would give me essays of his to read and, and, and would call me on the phone. Those of you who are younger, this is a phone. <laughs> <laughs> so he would call me on the phone. Um, and he talked to me like a scholar. In fact, by the time I graduated from high school, he had me speak to the C.S. Lewis Society of New York. Ooh. Give a little talk on something I was thinking about. Um, 
But actually, after I went off to college, um, I didn't really hear from Dr. Como anymore. Um, I founded the C.S. Lewis Society at Harvard, um, which is an organization that still thrives to this day with uh, C.S. Lewis fanatics who get to Harvard, uh, which is where I went as an undergraduate, um, and, and they meet in, in John Harvard's brew house in a, in a basement, just like the Inklings would have, the Eagle and Child, if you've ever been on a C.S. Lewis pilgrimage. Um, we were able to find a bar that had just opened uh, now 20, 25 years ago. Um, it had a basement, and it still does, and that's where the C.S. Lewis Society of Harvard meets. Um, and I think I wrote Dr. Como once or twice and told him that we had a group at, at Harvard. Um, but it wasn't, um, I'm gonna get choked up. Um, it wasn't until I got your brochure that I looked and saw his face. I haven't uh, spoken to him in about 20 years. We've spoken since. But, but to look at this page of your C.S. Lewis scholars, and to see that man on the same page as me. It was um, such a lesson in mentoring. And it was a lesson on, on two very different people um, who both loved C.S. Lewis. Um, and, and both our faith was so fed by it. And such different people. Um, I've spoken to him since. He, he opened the book up and he couldn't believe it either. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so he sent me a note and said, you've been busy. Because <laughs> <laughs> we both Googled each other, and he's been busy too. Dr. Como is an Italian Catholic who goes to church every day. He loves the Catholic church, and he told me when I was 16 to never forget that it was the one true church. <laughs> And I hope I'm not getting him in trouble. I, he still believes that. <laughs> but um, it'll be something that he and I will continue to keep between ourselves. But let me just say that our reunion conversation last week, um, it broke his heart that I am not a Catholic. Um, and yet, we enjoyed talking to each other anyway. He didn't understand that I was ordained. <laughs> Um, but I was able to tell him the story of um, oh, the last uh, few decades of my life. Uh, the only uh, I got a master's in theology and was working for the Catholic Church in Boston. I was a, a speechwriter for the uh, for Cardinal Law just before things exploded. And I was a very young person in my 20s with a degree in Catholic moral theology uh, who had time thought it was my job to defend the Cardinal against the Boston Globe. And for many of us, it became very clear that, that it was our job to defend the Globe against the Cardinal. So I uh, was looking for a church. I knew a lot of the priests who were involved up there and worked with them. I even helped them into their new jobs. So I started going to a, a, a little Anglican monastery. I thought they were Catholic, and on the third day, and they told me that, that the Society of St. John the Evangelist was not Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd already gone for three days, and uh, that one looks Catholic to me. <laughs> um, and before I get back to Lewis, I'll just say, so I was, uh, I was looking for a, a new Catholic church in some ways, um, and then I realized I was actually also a gay person. Uh, and I had such great love for the Catholic Church and thought I would spend the rest of my life giving my life back to the church since it had saved my parents' lives. Um, but I had this unconditional love of the Catholic Church, but the feeling wasn't um, mutual. Um, I'm not anti-Catholic. I love the Catholic Church. I do believe in my heart. I'm one of the C.S. Lewis scholars that believes that Lewis may have converted to the Roman Catholic Church had he lived longer over a female ordination. He had other letters that he wrote. There's sort of an open debate among Lewis people, by the way, what Lewis would have done if he would have lived into his 90s through all the changes in the church. I'm one of the people that falls on the side that I do think he may have a, ultimately wound up at the Church of Rome. Uh, on the other hand, is he's got written other letters where he says, you know, he doesn't have any Rome popish leanings, and he says very things that Anglicans would say. But he felt very strongly against the ordination of women, so it wouldn't surprise me if uh, that would put him over. But the conversation I had last week with Dr. Como, who I, and I just can't believe you're going to be able to hear him preach in a few weeks, um, he 
he understood that i found myself orphaned by the church i didn't leave it so instead we talked more about lewis and what lewis had taught me and how i have been reading lewis through all this because lewis says horrible things about gay people and has a kind of appreciation of women that is about 1934 so dr cohen basically said why are you why are you still reading lewis i said because i i fell in love with him you were there and he laughed and then he told me things about lewis he doesn't understand and both of us were stuck with the fact that lewis has converted us again and again to a closer relationship with christ that's why we're both still on board even though you'll see us on one page there two very different lives now that intersected at one time 25 years ago over c.s lewis and we both have taken lewis with us in very different directions i'm doing my best i've got weddings and funerals but i'm going to try so hard to get here when he preaches i don't know when i can i haven't told him that because to stand in the same room with dr james cohen after all these years and all these phases of his life and mine and that we both love lewis today more than yesterday it will be a wonderful thing sometime so let me say something about narnia that that might open up a time to when the actual stories of the chronicles of narnia touched you remember c.s lewis said that the, the intellect um, is the organ of reason right so the mind is how we think but lewis is also very famous for another phrase he said the imagination is the organ of meaning that is to say there are some things that the intellect cannot entertain cannot respond to it's a language it doesn't speak but the imagination is like a different part think of it as a different part of your heart or a different part of your brain it does unique things kind of like a lawnmower and a dishwasher they're both helpful they're both domestic they, they have some similarities and yet they do entirely different things c.s lewis in 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 his book um, mere christianity there's a chapter that comes toward the end you might miss it and by the way the first half of mere christianity i think is fantastic the, the, the defenses of god explanations of god definitely when i meet new christians i want to rip the book in half and give them the first section and say just read the whole thing in the second half he starts talking about the ideal christian marriage and things like that and um not so much um that's where lewis sort of says like you know a marriage should be like 51 percent, 49 percent in terms of power um and men should really be the 51 and women should you know um uh, and the truth is i sort of laugh because i have all my uncles think that too so i don't hate lewis for that um uh and 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 it's funny in my marriage now i don't care who is the 51 and who is the 49 it all works either way um but i find for young adults and for a younger audience they get they get held up on some of that stuff uh, but th there's still no one better on whether or not there is a god in the world it's not only rational but um, liberating to believe in god but there's this part right toward the end and it's a paragraph any of you that know near christianity very well it's the chapter is called let's pretend it's three pages and it comes almost out of nowhere. It's when Lewis talks about, this is why I think it's so funny that our evangelical brothers and sisters love Lewis so much. I'm like, have you read Mere Christianity? <laughs> Where Lewis says, you know, receiving the Lord's Supper is like essential to salvation, um, which he does. Uh, so those of you who have friends who believe that if you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, they'd obviously just sort of taken out part of Mere Christianity. Because Lewis would say, well, that's a good start. But you, you walk as the body of Christ in the world and you receive the body of Christ. And Lewis wouldn't say that you're not going to heaven if you don't do that. He would just say, what are you doing if you don't do that? So you're a follower of Jesus without consuming the Lord's life? How, how's that going? That's a great car with no gas. <laughs> Lewis wouldn't be offended by the Christian that doesn't receive communion. He would just be mystified. Are you pushing your own car? <laughs> I feel bad for someone who's not receiving communion. He wouldn't judge them. It would make no sense to Lewis. And in that same part of your Christianity, he talks about saying the Lord's Prayer. And, and the, the chapter, Let's Pretend, comes right in that discussion of the Lord's Prayer. And I love this. It's where Lewis says, there's two kinds of pretending. 
he said there's one like a pretext where you like pretend to be a banana as a kid or something. You know, you're pretending something that isn't true. And he says, but then there's a second kind of pretending, a good pretending, where you pretend something that might be true if you can just live into it, like pretending to be a fireman in nursery school, pretending to be a teacher on the bulletin board when you're six. He goes, that's, that's good pretending. When you allow yourself to imagine something that isn't yet but could be, even if it feels impossible. And he would say, keep going with that. That's good pretending. And his example is the Lord's Prayer. He said, look at the first two words. Our Father. Now, in a very British way, he says, he said, that's a, that's a bit of cheek. <laughs> <laughs> Which basically means that, that's, that's a pretty nervy thing to do. Because think about it. He said, the second you say it, you're claiming you're a child of God. You don't say their father, a father, the father. We say our father. He said, that's good pretending. But if you say it again and again and again, you will become the thing you're pretending to be. So say the our father again and again. And every time you do more deeply, you become a child of God in your mind and in your imagination. And what could you do? What could I do if we really believed that? Not only would there be no orphans ever, but what could the world take from you? Who cares what the world offers to you? You are a child. Keep saying the Our Father, though, as we said. That is good pretending. It lets you think about liturgy and worship. Why do we kneel? You know, this is the right thing I teach in high school. Why do we kneel? We don't kneel because God needs us to kneel. We we'll kneel because we have bodies. And sometimes bodies do things other than what we would like or want things other than what we would like. So together in community, in the presence of Christ, where we're thinking and talking and singing and praying about miracles, we actually willfully choose to have our body reflect the best in us. I see that as pretending for making good decisions for the rest of the week. I hate kneeling. But when I do it, it's a reminder that I'm, I'm asking my body to pray along with my words. And what might happen is during the week, I might start to spend and talk and vote like my prayers. At what point are you going to bring your body along with you in your faith life? Why not try it in church? Good pretending. It's also a good word because it doesn't mean we're absolutely right. But pretending is just about the level of seriousness we should take for ourselves and our liturgies. When I um, went off to college, let me say after my uh, sister's death, um, my mother, she, um, what can you say about a mother of a child who's died? Um, she's never, um, she's never healed, but she's healing every day in ways that none of us thought possible. My father, on the other hand, who was an alcoholic before that happened, um, really stopped healing. Um, and I was eight when she died, and he died when I was 18. Uh, he just got sicker and sicker and, and spent a lot of my high school years in a hospital, in a VA hospital, because we didn't have insurance. Um, so I would visit him a lot in the hospital. Um, and he, he really died from sadness. I mean, there was a diagnosis, but I don't need to tell you this. You can die from that. Um, he just never was able to feel any of the resurrection in, in him. So I went off to college, a little scared, because uh, I didn't really know anyone who'd been to college. Um, and I was there for a week, and he died. Um, and I went home for the funeral, uh, it was on a Saturday, and uh, Cambridge is about three hours north of, of Bronxville, so when the funeral was done, I actually just walked around my house, and the casseroles were out, and all the relatives, and I decided to go back to college. I mean, why not? And I say, how long do you stay, right? I thought, I, you know, he's been dying for years, so I packed up my stuff, and I, I got on the Amtrak and went up to Cambridge, and arrived back to my college dorm on a Saturday night. Bumping into a lot of kids at Harvard Square who were like, hey, how are you? And I just, in my 
my mind, I was like, I was at my father's funeral today. I didn't tell anybody. So I, I, I went up to my roommates who'd all been, they were all traumatized. I had a group of roommates in a suite and we'd know each other for weeks. So we kind of gave these awkward hugs, that was weird. Um, I had a single bedroom, I went in and put my suitcase down and my other stuff hadn't been opened yet. Um, and I remember sitting on the edge of my bed having this thought. And when I think now about the power of Christ, who was just about to come into that room like a lion, I sat on the edge of the bed and I thought about the burial that we just had. The gravestone had my sister's name on it, right? And my father's was like a temporary, you know how it works, they don't carve that for months. And like we, it felt like we had just buried her. I mean, it had been 10 years, but it was the same hole. And we dug it, you know how you actually, you have a family plot? So we literally dug up the same hole and lowered my father into it on top of what would have been her coffin. And, the, and frankly, the relatives were kind of the same. So there I was sitting in a college dorm room, and I thought to myself, is this what life is? Every couple of years, you just gather around the same hole. And sooner or later, you're going to be it. This was the rational person in me. Like, I wasn't suicidal. I wasn't even sad. I just felt like, wow, I'm 18, and I'm, I think I've already actually figured it out. Life is about what you do in between gathering at the hole. So I, I'm just going to try to find a meaningful life, but that, that's kind of what it is. And then my dorm, uh, dorm uh, RA, you know these people that like graduate students who, you know, get free housing to just like babysit college students? <laughs> she knocked on my bedroom door, um, and I found out later she's what C.S. Lewis would call a spy in enemy occupied territory. <laughs> she was a divinity school student, <laughs> which in her doesn't mean much. I gotta just say something. Um, <laughs> Get excited. If you don't know this landscape, just take my word for it. I mean, there's a reason that there's a t-shirt up there that says at Harvard they believe in uh, at most one God. Um, <laughs> so she was really a plant in enemy occupied territory because she was a Christian at the Harvard Divinity School, which was really um, a black swan. But I didn't know any of that. I'd only known her for a week. So she comes in and she's got like a, a book in her hand and she's just standing at the entrance to my door and it was late, it was like 10 p.m. at night. And she said, um, I'm sorry about your father. And I said, well, and I looked at her, I was very sarcastic already. And I said, yeah, okay, well, you can go fill out the form that you saw me tonight. It's fine. Um, I'm not a danger to myself or others so you can go to sleep. She smiled and she said, um, thanks. She said, you know, there is a form. I guess I know how to go fill it out. And I, in my head, I thought that was kind of a generous response to my sarcasm. Because there is a form. She said, actually, I came up here, though, I was wondering if I could read you a story. And all of a sudden it occurred to me that she actually had come to my room to read, and I could tell by the cover of the book that it was like a children's story. And I thought, is this woman seriously going to read me a bedtime story? Is there some manual for you? And I may even said to her, like, is there some manual that says you're supposed to come up here and read me a story? Because if there is, it's not helpful. She smiled and she said, I, I don't have to come into your room. I, I, I can just sit here and while you're unpacking it if, and just read it. I remember thinking, what's the fastest way to get this psycho out of here? <laughs> I said, you know what? You can sit and read it wherever you'd like. So I started working on my suitcase and she sat right at the entrance to the, the bedroom of the eight by eight bedroom and read me the story of Eustace from the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And for those of you that don't know, Eustace was an annoying jerk, younger cousin of the four famous children who gets dragged to Narnia, he resents it all, he doesn't believe in any of it, he wants to know why Narnia doesn't have better roads, <laughs> he's a real bureaucrat, he's a know-it-all, He's like that kid at Thanksgiving who's younger than everyone else, but sort of smarter than everyone else, which means every time they start a game, they're the one who winds up crying. And you all know a Eustace. Some of you are a Eustace. <laughs> it's okay, it's, it's church, you can admit it. But Eustace is a complete jerk, and he gets so mad at the kids in Narnia, he just hates this following Aslan nonsense. He just, where are the maps? Where's the plan? Who's in charge? All the questions you ask when you're insecure. 
And then he sneaks off to where a dragon has a cave, and he goes, and there's all this gold. And he's like, oh, this is great. This is actually what I need, money. So he climbs up on top of the gold and falls asleep. And when he wakes up the next morning, long story short, he's turned into a dragon. And he doesn't realize it at first, but once he realizes it, he's terrified and he's scared. And he goes back to try to see the kids, right? But everyone's scared. He's a dragon. And he's like, how do I tell them? It, it, it's not me. And of course, Lewis writes there, when you want what dragons want, and you act like dragons act, you don't be surprised if you wake up a dragon. We'll talk about that next week, by the way. It has a lot to do with heaven and hell. Quite often, you become what you are doing. So he became what he was doing, being a selfish, greedy dragon. He just became one. Actually, it makes total sense, doesn't it? That's the rationality that Eustace loved. got handed right back to him. But he wants to not be a dragon. In fact, when he was a little boy, he put on, he picked up a golden um, bracelet and put it on. It's kind of stolen. It's called shoplifting. But when he became a dragon in it, you see it was cutting into him? Because this, it fit on him as a little boy. But when he became a dragon, that little bracelet was just cutting into the scales. So he wants to get all this off, and he keeps scratching and scratching. And how the story ends is that he winds up seeing the lion. And the lion kind of calls him to follow him, and Eustace follows him and says, I can't, I don't remember if the lion said to follow him, or I just knew I had to follow him, and I was scared of him, but I also loved him, I didn't know what was going on. And long story short, he brings Eustace to a big garden with trees and a well. Thank you, Bueller. And the boy wants to get into the water because his arm hurts so much and his scales are so heavy. And he realizes that maybe if he starts to scratch, he can peel them off. You know how snakes can peel off their skins? So he realizes, wait a minute, that's why the lion brought me here. I can scratch off these scales and then I can put my arm in the water and I can feel better. So he starts scratching and then he starts to literally peel the scales off. And he said, oh, it felt so good, like a scab, you know, because he's pulling all this off. And then he goes over to the water and he puts his foot in the water and he sees it's a dragon's foot. So the scales aren't gone. So then he looks at the lion and the lion says nothing. So then he says, okay, I'm going to do it again. He scratches deeper, he digs deeper and pulls off another thicker, heavier, smellier, whole skin. And now he's got two piles of skin. And then he puts his foot in the water and he sees he has a dragon's foot. And then he starts, comes out again, he's getting so frustrated and the lion says nothing. But there's light on the lion. Well, the light isn't coming from the moon, it's coming from the lion. So finally, Ed, Eustace tries one more time, he pulls off the thicker, knobbier skin, puts his foot in again, and he's still a dragon, and he just collapses by the water, and the lion finally says, I have to do it. And Eustace didn't know what else to do, but he just, just said, fine. And the lion takes the skin off, and Eustace says it hurts so much more when, when he did it. But it actually came off. And I love the feeling of it finally coming off. And then he picked me up, and he threw me into the water, and I splashed. And it was hard because I, I was used to having skin. And I looked around, and I had the arms of a boy again. He'd been made into a person again. He'd been remade by the lion. And then the lion disappears, and he gets out of the water, and he goes running down to Edmund and Peter and all the other children. And he finds Edmund, and, and, and Edmund says, what's happened to him? And Eustace was like, you have no idea. <laughs> I don't know what happened to me, but I was a dragon, now I'm a boy, and maybe it's a dream, and Edmund says something beautiful. He says, well, you've been undragoned. <laughs> That's evidence of something. Like, maybe if it was a dream, where are your scales? You've been undragoned. He said, I think you've met Aslan. And of course, Eustace says, Aslan, um, do you know Aslan? Edmund says at the end of the chapter, Aslan knows everything. So when this resident advisor had finished that last line, I could still hear her voice saying, in 1991, she stood up and said, peace be with you. She walked away. And I just sat on the edge of the bed. Like, did I just hear a bedtime story? And I felt... Physically, the weight of my scales, I almost couldn't stand up. It felt so heavy. I literally felt like I had scales on every part of my body, that I probably started growing at my sister's death. The armor, the trying to smile, watching my parents have a literal nervous breakdown for a few years. 
starting to work on their small business and take care of the house on my own i started filing our taxes when i was in middle school to try to help two people whose lives were collapsing and to be a happy warrior through all of it i did i only applied to one college i was a very driven person and there i was sitting on that bed so sad grieving so many things having just decided that life is a time to put on your armor and try to have a good time in between gathering your family at the grave and this woman shows up with a story that i don't have to live like this that the scales that i don't even know how they came on to me and i know i can't get them off me can come off i've been a christian i've been going to daily mass for years but it never occurred to me that that it wasn't my job to go to mass to get stronger all of a sudden this woman's reading a story that says no 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 that's not what the lion wants to do the lion doesn't want you to get stronger the lion wants you to get more lion in you wants to remake your life not make you better at everything not to save other people but to save you stop being everyone's messiah and follow one and i literally and i think of c.s lewis when he writes that he he fell on his knees the most reluctant convert of all england as he described himself and i kid you not that i actually turned around on that bed and got on my knees on in my own dorm room just like lewis had done in his own conversion and said to god let's start christianity over again i know the bible i know my church i have never known how to stop putting the scales on and i hear that you might be able to take these off and i can be lighter and more free and when you have scales on you don't feel the, the pain of grief as much but you also don't feel much of anything else either so i knew that it's dangerous to have god take your scales off because if, if if they come off it means that everything can hurt you now but lewis's great invitation in the chronicles of narnia is better everything hurts you than nothing touch you and lewis's famous phrase to love it all is to be vulnerable love anything he says even an animal and your heart will definitely be wrong and possibly be broken but he said if you keep it safe he said wrap little luxuries and hobbies around it it will be safe it will be unbreakable it will be irredeemable in the coffin and its silence and its selfishness nothing will hurt it nor will anything touch it including god lewis said the only escape of all the perturbations of love is hell the invitation to feel to take your heart of stone and receive a heart of flesh which means it will hurt but god takes the stone out God takes the scale off. Aslan blows his breath into the stone creatures and they live and breathe again in Narnia. This is how it works. I've been obsessed with C.S. Lewis. I, I work for the BBC and help them write a documentary. I work with a professor to write the book, um, The Question of God, which was about C.S. Lewis and Sigmund Freud. That was my professor and I was his researcher for that book. I had something going with Lewis in my life every year I met Dr. Como, he got me thinking about it. That woman walked into my room, sent from God, and that story of Eustace saved my life. Not my soul, my life. And as you go out today, I hope that you can think in your own life um, where the scales are, where you have made yourself a dragon for very good reasons. Some of you made yourself a dragon for less good reasons. But whatever your reasons are, if you feel stuck, I've been saying all morning that the great innovation of Lewis, like there's a wardrobe and you walk through it into this other world. You do have to open the door and move through it. That's the free will part. At a certain point, Lewis had to stop scratching and say, not my will, but yours be done. And there begins the fight. So that's a little heavy. The room's a little heavy right now. <laughs> 
the interest of time for those of you that need to go, if you would just sit with me for 10 seconds um, and close your eyes, and this is how we'll have you <clears throat> feast and take something with you to go. I just want you to think right now of one source of your scales. Is it a person? Is it a job? Is it the lack of either of those two things? Is it loneliness? Is it addiction? Is it frustration? Is it depression? What is holding you together but locking you inside? Heavenly Father, you created us to be free, to be your children who play and who sing and who cry together. We are one in the body of Christ. Help us find those things in our life that are walls, that are prisons, that are scales. Help us. Help us to believe that you will reach with your hand and give us the freedom you have planted in us as a family. Thank you for every person who came into this room. You alone know why they are here, and you alone can go with them to change them because they will. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. If you need to go, feel free to stand up and go. Um, and I will stay here, though, and entertain any questions um, from those of you who do not have to go. My friend. Uh, what would you recommend as a starting point for someone who's never read it? Yes, that's great. If you have never read C.S. Lewis before, I would begin with the Chronicles of Narnia. If you would like to read some of his non-fiction, um, some people would say um, to read Mere Christianity. I would not. I would say begin with his autobiography. In it, he actually refers to a lot of his own writing. So listen to him of what you should read. Does that make sense? Um, so fiction, definitely the, the line the Witch in the Wardrobe, which is about 116 pages in the Penguin edition. Um, not a huge read. And if you want to read some nonfiction, begin with Surprised by Joy. Which is, again, remember the, wife, the name of his wife, Joy. So it is both the story of Surprised by Joy, who we met in his 50s. Um, but that's a very important theological category of joy. And then there's a billion, billion, billion other things. But... Thank you. Yeah. I was thinking about teenagers and imagination. Yep. It seemed like uh, my 15-year-old has sort of put the imagination on the back burner now. Right. And although she does, have, she has read some Lewis, and she does, she seems open to that. I wonder how, how or when they re-engage. Yeah, we have an educational system and an educational situation right now that does not feed the imagination, either of parents or of children of any age. So we just have to name that. That we have uh, an education system now that is aimed at productivity and performance, and um, uh, and that's just a, that is just the world that we're in. Um, so it is very hard because the imagination requires leisure. It, there's a commandment about this. Um, it requires rest, and in my experience, young people have a natural imagination that is so powerful, so powerful. Um, it literally is coming online. So you have the prefrontal cortex. Remember, the brain only grows really twice in life, in the womb, big surge. And then at puberty, there's a second big surge of the prefrontal cortex. That ends around your mid-20s. That's important, by the way. We used to think the brain was done around 18 or 19. Turns out that's just when you finished high school. We convinced ourselves for about 200 years that that was the end of the brain growth. That was stupid. Um, that's dumb, okay? That's a very technical way of saying it. The neurologist would now tell you the brain really grows through your mid-20s, which explains a lot. Um, on the other hand, from that point on, our brains are all dying. Sorry. <laughs> you know, the, the truth will set you free. So you, unless you have a severe injury, you really don't get a brain thrust approach after those two times. So they're at a time that is the most naturally, the lights are going on in the prefrontal cortex. They are more imaginative now, which is why Einstein, Thomas Aquinas wrote the Summa Theological when he was 26. Uh, John Calvin wrote the Institutes of the Christian Religion when he was 26. Um, Einstein came up with the theory of relativity when he was 19. There's a reason for this. This is a, so it is tragic.
that we create an educational system that leaves no room for rest and recuperation up until you're 25. Because there are things your brain can do up until you're 25 that it will never do again. Try to learn a language when you're 36. I don't care, babble, Rosetta Stone, you're gonna fail at that, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just save the money. The number of people that actually learn a language with those things are, are, it's a negligible number. But start talking to a kid who's 11 or four or 16 who gets dropped into a country and they'll be fluent in a month. So they're naturally creative and imaginative. Um, and right now the most fearful we are in America is for young people in every conceivable way. You're afraid of what they're doing. You're afraid of what they're not doing. You're afraid of what they are learning. You're afraid of what they're not learning. It is terrible. Baby boomers, Gen Xers, the greatest generation, every generation above teenagers has dumped their anxiety on teenagers. We want them to do everything and nothing. We want them to succeed and not worry about not succeeding. We don't want them to fail. We want them to learn from failure. It's insane. Whether you have children or grandchildren or godchildren or nephews or nieces, it is awful. It is a truly awful situation. It is amazing more of them don't drink. I don't want to hear how many of them drink. I'm amazed they all don't drink. How could you not need to self-medicate with the insane messages that you get about the body and the mind and money right now? It is insane. I don't care what social class you are. Poor, rich. What about your kids who, if you have some money and you're actually supporting their life, you think they don't figure that out? They know that the only reason they have any money is because you're giving it to them. Do you know how, how much of a failure they're worried about being? They know at 18 they could do nothing without you. At least at 18, I knew I was paying some of our bills. I now look back and I'm so grateful. I don't know what I would have done if I were 18, 20, 21, my parents were still paying my bills. Do you know how, the, how, how disempowering that is? All you can do is let your parents down, and you know now, you're probably never gonna have more money than your parents do. It's a nightmare right now for young people. So for those of you who are depressed, and you're like, so much for the good news. <laughs> Where's the gospel in this? Um, church matters! This is, our, this is our resistance community. You can get into a community and see that, that you can be overweight or underweight, and people love you here. You can be totally smart or, or, or not a scholar at all, and you can take communion too, and you can be in the youth group too, and you can have different levels of hygiene because you're a boy and you're 12, and people will still probably talk to you <laughs> at a distance, but I tell you, we've always needed the church, but we need it now more than ever. My friend Emily Gibbon over there, who I've known um, before today, <laughs> for a couple months. Is, is one of the, uh, I'd like to call, wizards of Christian formation, who understands this personally as having children, but also as someone who works in formation, that the work we are doing right now to form communities, that even if our young people don't actually show up, they even hear rumors that we love them, we are praying for them, and we as adults continue to believe that everything you see is not everything there is, and that there is a source of identity from baptism. That's the message you bear. So don't even get too sad about the teenagers that aren't in the room. I do hope one day they come in the room. But trust me, it is still an eternal blessing to them to know that the church loves them. Because fewer and fewer institutions in this country give that message. All institutions want them. You are the only institution now. I can't believe I'm saying this. But we've reached the point in the 21st century where we are one of the only institutional families in the country and in the lives of a young person who there's even a rumor that we love them unconditionally. So go home today and pray for the young people in your parish. Yes, I hope they come to events. You've got people like Emily who are doing their darndest to get them here. But even if they're not, trust me, you are a radical idea as long as you continue to exist. And there are young people, as long as they know you're here, they will not be able to say that everything is Amazon, everything is Uber, everything can be delivered in one day. You are only what you can spend. You all stand four square against that and say, you are a child of God and we love you unconditionally. And we will be here whether you can afford it or not. The average student right now is going to be $87,000 in debt when they are 21. And in this part of the country, those of you that go to four-year colleges at 25, and they will be over $200,000 in debt. That community needs to hear that the church loves them. They, they, there's a freedom here they can't find anywhere else. And more and more, they're not going to find it anywhere else, financially, professionally. In 1970, the average person held a job for 28 years. In the year 2000, the average person held a job for 18 years. Now the average is 18 months. The world is shifting like an earthquake culturally. 
So what can you say to a teenager right now? I love you. And they'll roll their eyes. And you'll think, well, what's the next thing to say to them? I love you. It's tragic that you're becoming one of the only people who will say that. And we're one of the only communities that will embody that. But then let's be that. And by the way, the church survived under Nero. We will be just fine with the current administration. <laughs> go because this is a day of rest. There's a commandment about you all doing something restful today. Um, but I will see you next week if you're around. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>